All right. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Daniel Veza and my talk today is about theming with bundle classes, layout builder and twig. Uh, I've been involved in a very large scale Drupal 9 build for the last year and building the site this way has been a really good experience and one that I thought was worth sharing. After this talk, or after I submitted this talk, I thought about the more clickbait name of Goodbye Managed Display, but I thought about it far too late, so we get the more boring title. Like I said, my name's Daniel Veza. I work at Previous Next as a developer, uh, and I've been using Drupal since 2014. Um, these slides and the demo site that I've built for this talk will be on my GitHub later. Um, so, you know, if you want to refresh yourself or come back with any questions, let me know. I know what usually happens with me is that I think about about 100 questions as soon as the conference finishes and I can't ask them anymore. So if that happens to you, feel free to reach out. My name's Daniel Veza on the Drupal Slack uh, and I'm mainly in the Australia and New Zealand channel. The first thing I wanted to go over was bundle classes and I put a very hyperbole statement of one of the best new additions to core. Uh, and I actually think that's true. Bundle classes let you define a PHP class per entity on your site or per entity type on your site. So you can have a bundle class for things like node types, vocabularies, media, block content, uh, or even entity types like user. You can have a bundle class per one. What this means is that you can keep your business logic in one single place per entity type. This means that developers don't need to dig around the theme or 100 modules to figure out where a particular bit of functionality comes from. They should just be able to go straight to the bundle class. It saves a lot of time and it keeps everything quite clean and compact. Since they're just standard PHP classes, bundle classes have a lot of wins around code sharing. So you can define base classes or interfaces or traits. Uh, any of that stuff that lets you share code and stop duplicating code across your site. Uh, and part of this leads to a, like I said, better code, but it also leads to better testability. This is a really big win in my book because I'm a big fan of testing code and bundle classes makes that really clean. Uh, and the last part is about Twig. So bundle classes have built-in integration with Twig. Any function in your bundle class that starts with get or with has, they can be used automatically inside Twig templates. So you don't need to have things like pre-processes in your code. Uh, having less PHP code in the theme is a big win for me. At least your theme just focus on the things that it should be focusing on like the CSS and the JavaScript for your site. Bundle classes are also opt-in. So it's not something you have to commit to and spend you know, 100 hours building out bundle classes for everything on your site. They can be done piece by piece when a new piece of functionality comes in or when a bug comes in. You can definitely keep things going the way they were before. Now, unfortunately, there isn't any other talks on bundle classes at this conference but I highly recommend you look into them more. They're awesome, I can't imagine not using them. The second part is Layout Builder. So Layout Builder's been stable now for a really long time. It's probably not quite the hot new thing anymore, but it is a really powerful site building tool. With Layout Builder, you can set a base layout for your content types and give editors control over how the page looks on a per node basis. So users can add or remove blocks, fields, media, all with a pretty simple drag and drop interface. In earlier versions of Drupal, this was possible with things like the panels module, or people would leverage paragraphs to give something quite similar to this. But now we've got it in core with a stable core maintained API. And with it now being in core, there's a suite of contributed modules that we have used on this project to really help the layout builder and editorial experience. One of the drawbacks 
to Layout Builder out of the box is that every single block becomes available for your editors to use right away. This means pointless blocks like powered by Drupal or every single field could be given as a block, which means that your editors need to know how formatters work, which is just, it's not necessary. They don't need to know that stuff. That's, that's more our kind of role. So the first thing, oh, and for example, on the site that we have built, we have built about 20 or so blocks that belong to a program content type. And out of the box, it means these 20 program blocks would be available for something like <coughs> an article, which <coughs> why do they need to be there? It just clogs the whole editor editorial screen. To fix this, we use Layout Builder restrictions, which allows you to configure a list of blocks that the editor can see and embed on a per section basis. It really cleans up that screen so they only see what they want to use, what they can use, and what they won't get in trouble for using. There's also Layout Builder Lock, which prevents editors from editing or deleting certain sections. For example, you, you can configure Layout Builder Lock so that you can't delete the hero of a page because you probably want to have that in. And you can use Layout Builder Restrictions to stop the editor from being able to place the hero in the right column of a two-column layout. Common, sen common sense says, you know, let's not do these things, but, you know, let's protect against it just in case. The last one I wanted to talk about was Layout Builder Claro. Oops, apologies. Is Layout Builder Claro, which uh, improves the drag and drop and the general feel of Layout Builder with Core's Claro theme. There's a talk tomorrow at 11 from Joshua Graham, which is an overview and introduction to Layout Builder. I'm sure they will go over some of the finer concepts that might not be touched about in this talk, so I recommend you go to that. And the last point was Twig. So I'm sure having built Drupal 8, 9, and 10 sites, that everyone's pretty familiar with Twig. But for this project, we've been using it extensively with a Twig-based design system that we've built with KSS. Our extensive use of Twig allows us to match the components in our design system from Drupal and have real control over our markup. This cleaner markup has a lot of benefits. It's easier to style, it's got performance improvements because you're not bloating the DOM with lots of unnecessary elements like all of the wrappers that come out of the box with Drupal. Um, and I've also, I've loved and I've used Display Suite heavily in the past, but with this approach we've found that it's just not needed anymore. And not needing to click around the Manage Display with all of the different buttons and then just not hitting save right at the very end. <laughs> it's something that I've done many times and something that I'm glad to not need to think about anymore. So for a quick little micro demo, I've set up a Umami site. Uh, if you're as bad as cooking as I am and you don't want to cook the same four things for the rest of your life, you'll probably go on a lot of recipe sites that look just like this. But in this example, you'll probably notice that something is missing that every single recipe site has to have. Anyone have any ideas on what that might be? Three of your life. Exactly. You're exactly right. And just to point out how good that is, I've called it the life story block. <laughs> because what we really want is to let our readers, you know, read a thousand characters from us before they get to the recipe that they actually just wanted to look at. So I've added this perfectly named life story block and it's got three fields. It's got a sad scale field, which measures how sad the story is. <laughs> it's got a read time field in minutes for the length of the story. And then a field for the story itself, which is just a regular text formatted field. Because we have Layout Builder and a default layout, we can now place this block anywhere on the page. Because, of course, the life story is the most important part of the page, I've added it to the very top here under the whole big story section. But I could also place it under the recipe if I wanted to be nice, 
or I could remove the sidebar section and place place it there maybe. Would probably look a bit odd to have it there and something that we would probably stop with layout builder restrictions. Probably shouldn't be there. So here's the markup that's rendered for that one block. It's pretty long, it's pretty div soupy, and it feels like it's got about 100 classes. So out of the box, each field has got three, wrap three divs, and there's an overall wrapping div. So for an extremely simple block, we're left with 10 divs and 27 lines of HTML. And all that really does is display the content of three fields, two of them which are a number. This adds up pretty quickly, let's say if you've got 10 of these on a page or 10 similar blocks on a page, starts to add up pretty quick. So, a new requirement is in. Extensive user research says that users find it far too hard just to read the time in minutes. We now need it to say short, medium, or long. So, under five minutes would be short. 6 to 10 medium and 11 or plus minutes would be long. So let's use this opportunity to convert our block to a twig based layout. And this is the first step and where my original clickbaity name of goodbye managed display came from. When we move our block over to a twig based layout we just don't need any of this stuff anymore. We're handling the rendering elsewhere. So let's take some control over that markup and add a template for the blog. This is a very simple bundle life story block template that has this markup in it. It's pretty clean, it's pretty easy, and it wipes out all of those Drupal wrappers that were bloating our DOM. We've got a couple of uh, variables in here, and for this first example, they come from a preprocess. While we have the full markup control, we could also change the sad scale and the read time fields to be probably a more semantically correct definition list. This would be a pain to do without having it inside Twig. So here is where we add those variables to the template. We're currently doing this by this preprocess. The sad, story, uh, the sad scale and the life story fields are just grabbing the values exactly from the field. And the read time is being converted to a label just with a very simple match function. Spoiler, this is the code that we'll soon be converting over to our bundle class. So let's compare. For the people with poor memory, this is the old markup, the pretty long, pretty old, pretty gross stuff. And this is the new markup. So the new markup that's significantly clean, it's significantly smaller. Adding the twig template has removed all of those Drupal wrappers. It's taken us from 10 divs to one, just the wrapping one and from 27 lines of HTML to six, all while retaining the same look and the same feel of the block. Uh, at the same time, we've added a life story class at the very top, uh, which is just for better CSS targeting. What this means is that if you've got good code splitting set up in your theme, you could use this approach to load only the life story, CSS, and JavaScript when this block is rendered, rather than having that included globally across everything. You could easily attach a library to the top of this. So, where are we now? We've met the new requirement, and at the same time, we have reduced our markup to be a lot cleaner, so that's a big win. The code right now is in a preprocess in the theme, which makes code sharing messy and hard to find. And testing also becomes difficult for this. Something like our read time conversion should probably be unit or kernel tested. With this code, that's not really possible or that clean. So testing this would most likely be a functional test. 
which means we would need to create probably a test user, create a test node, create a block, place the block with Layout Builder, render the page, and then assert that right label is being rendered on the page. That adds a lot of time, both in development and in CI minutes waiting for the tests to run, uh, and adds a lot of code, especially if you've got 20 of these. So let's fix that issue and convert our code over to a bundle class. So I've removed the preprocess and I've added this instead. It's a pretty easy bundle class since there is only the three fields. Uh, our sad scale and our, hopefully that's readable, our sad scale and story field are still just pulled directly from the field content. And our get read time label is just using that exact same match code that we had in the preprocess, which we've now removed. Our twig still looks pretty similar, except now I'm using all of the good stuff that comes from bundle classes. At the top there, you can see that we've got the block content entity available to us. So rather than having those variables from the preprocess, instead we're just using the get sad scale, get read time label, and get story methods from a bundle class directly. Uh, I've talked a lot about testing without really adding any examples. So now that we have our bundle class, let's just write a very quick code. So a uh, very quick test. Now uh, this test checks our read time label function and it checks that it returns short for one minute, medium for six minutes, and long for a really long number like a thousand minutes. Now across 10 runs of this test locally, it averaged out to taking about 550 milliseconds per test run. Uh, I can pretty much absolutely guarantee the other test would have taken significantly longer to run. Okay, so our example was for the most part pretty basic. So I thought I'd cover some of the other I guess advanced things we've been doing for this project and I'd include some real world content. So the first is adding a base class per entity type that should say not per entity, uh, traits and code sharing and then design systems and some redacted real world examples. Now when setting up bundle classes, the cleanest option is to make a base class per entity type and have all of your custom bundle classes extend that rather than extending node or extending block content. In this case, I've set up an abstract class called Umami node base, which just has two very simple functions. It's got the content type label in like its, its human readable form, not machine name, and it's got the readable publish date, which just pub is, does what it says. It's a readable version of the publish date. So by extending this class rather than extending node, all of your uh, node types on the site would have these functions available to them along with any other kind of generic functions you'd want across all of your nodes. And this would be the same for blocks or media or any of those other kind of base entity types. Another thing that we've found useful is having a dedicated module per bundle class. So rather than having umami bundles and having all, you know, media and recipe and blocks all in one big monster module, we would do something like create umami node where we would have this here and then we would have umami recipe where we would have the umami recipe bundle class it just means that you know us devs know where to go and we know where to look for something and if we wanted to do something like remove the recipes we would be able to delete that module without 
needing to worry about pulling out code from a bunch of different places because it's all just in one spot. Another one is that bundle classes can easily be moved between projects. So if these functions, you find that you're writing these, you know, on every site you build, you could just grab this exact thing, rename it from Umami to the new site name, and you would have your new base class with all of your common stuff that you've already used. Um, they're the same if you had, for example, an event that is very similar to another event. You can just grab your bundle class and grab all the code. So traits and code sharing. Because they're PHP classes, we can now use traits to share code. For example, if you've got fields that are on more than one block, you could just create a trait that does something like get read time. And then every time you add that field to a new block, you add that trait and you've already got that functionality available to you. In this case, I've removed the read time functionality from the original block I created and I've moved that into a train, which means that the next block I create that needs that same read time label, I can just add this trait to it and it will already have it without us needing to do anything else. So, like I did mention earlier, we build all of our components as Twig components outside of Drupal uh, in a design system. What this means is that rather than having all of that Twig in the block template, like we did in the demo earlier, we have all of our Twig inside of our design system and then Drupal just imports those Twig files. But what, we, what that means is that we need to attach the library, which we're attaching at the top here, and then we just include the Twig file from the design system. The problem being is that this feature.twig, it has a lot of variables in it. So we needed a way to pass all of the variables to the template. What we could do is say, include the template with, and then just list 10, you know, with variables. But we decided to try to do it in a bit more reusable way. We do have over 20 of these type of blocks in our site. So what we did is we made a simple template aware interface. We attach this template, this interface to all of our bundle classes where we pass variables to our templates, which looks like this. So this is our feature class for the template we looked at earlier. It extends our block content base and it implements the new interface I was talking about. That interface contains a get template variables function. And what that does is it collates all of the variables that the twig template needs and returns them into in a simple keyed array. And this pre-process is the secret source that links the bundle class and the template together. It checks if the bundle class implements our new interface, and if it does, it attaches all of the variables to the template with our get template variables function. I know I kind of bagged a bit on preprocesses earlier, but having this glue ended up being the best way to manage this. At first, we didn't even have this, and we just used get template variables straight inside the template. But what we found is that there were situations where we couldn't have the right level of cache control that we needed by doing that. So we added this here to kind of get around that and include the right levels of cacheability that we needed. So what this means, because this preprocess is the generic block template, all we need to do when a new block is created is implement our get templates variables function in the bundle class and all of our variables are automatically passed to our template with no extra work from us. This glue just automatically does it.
Uh, if you would like to read more about bundle classes, this talk so far has been very heavy on that side of things. Um, and the history, there's the Drupal change record on the slide. Uh, and there's an excellent three-part series from Derek Wright at 10, uh, 10 10.7 where he talks about their history with it and why they contributed, helped contribute it to Drupal. Uh, these are the layout, layout builder sub-modules, or sorry, contra-modules that we've used on our project. Uh, I've talked about most of these already. The top three are the, the big ones because I feel like those top three modules are really valuable for every single layout builder site you use. I don't, yeah, I think they should just be always used. But there are many more. These other two modules uh, have been really valuable for the site, but they're more the modules you use on a case by case basis rather than generic, you know, should be used everywhere modules like the other three. So this has been a close to a year long project and I do really feel like I've only scratched the surface with how far you can go on this approach. But time is limited so I've tried to compress everything down into something that hopefully is interesting and something you can try and learn about or take away and, and apply. Um, but yes, time is very limited. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Um, are there any questions? So I have a question. What's the threshold of when we decide to implement this solution comparing to these more simple solutions, I mean, uh, if it's like five entities for only one, is already sufficient now to uh, implement this way? Uh, yeah, it ends up being kind of up to how you want to implement it, I suppose. For example, if you only, even if you only had one entity on the site, you can still turn that into a bundle class. It's, it's really valuable that you can do it slowly over time. So if your entire site's you know, working, then maybe you don't need to touch certain parts. But if you've got a new feature to add, at the same time while you're doing that, you could add a bundle class for that one specific node type, for example, while leaving the rest of your site the way it already existed. Um, and it'll work exactly how it did before. That's the opt-in thing that you can do slowly over time. Yeah. <coughs> you said you you created like a base class that extends, you know, and then from there you extend it with your bundle classes. That base class, do you ever add more functions to that? Rather, than, but have you come to times where your bundle classes, you've got functions that are in there that you're doing sort of over and over again, and you think we might just add this to the base class? Do you ever do that? Yeah. That practice or that's a thing. No, absolutely. Yeah, we um, as time goes on, we started this project with very few methods in the the node base, and yeah, over time has gone on. We've definitely been adding shared functionality to it. There's been times, I suppose, where you need to decide to think about things as when to add it to the base class or when to use it as a trade. For example, if it's a very node-oriented thing that's going to be used across all of node, the node types, then I'd add it to the base class. If it's something like, we have one that's called uh, Entity with Title Field. And we can add that trait to blocks or media or nodes. So that's where I'd use it as a trait. Um, but yeah, definitely don't be afraid to add stuff to the, the node base class when it's used in multiple places. Uh, we have an example of the, the story block that was being put into the sort of layout builder. That's like a kind of per node layout builder, is it? So, it is, yeah. So, so what happens? Is that like is that just like a full fledged block, or is it kind of constrained to that node? Um, like, is it just just it's just like shortcuts creating a block and attaching it to that layout? Or so you can make 
the block, but if you did want the block to be across multiple nodes, you could attach it, you know, anywhere you want, essentially. Okay. Was, that, was that what you're asking? Sorry, yeah, just so, to... so, so it's basically still just creating a normal Drupal block, but via that interface, so and then just attaching it in that spot. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it is, like it is still like a standard uh, Drupal block, not like a special extra entity or anything. Okay. Yeah, every, everything's just the, the Drupal level. Yep. Um, what would be the best way to handle like optional fields though, so that we don't end up um, empty fields? <coughs> Uh, so that would probably be best done at the template level. So and, and with the twig yeah. templates, you can have like if uh, else condition. yeah, uh, just a if thing to say if um, yeah. In this case, if the story is empty, then just don't render mm. any of that content. Um, I would probably do that. Yeah, at the template level. Otherwise, you might get this situation where, like you said, you've got the life story wrappers, but nothing actually in it. <laughs> um, so you can do it at that level. But what if there's like heaps of fields in a block? So we would have like individual if else condition for field then? Yeah, if it was needed, yeah. Like for example, I don't, if I just go back, um, where is my, So, for example, in this case, I should probably have wrapped it if around this sad scale and this read time label field. I mean, in my case, they're mandatory, but if they weren't, then yeah. in this case, yeah, I would get sad scale and then an empty field there. Yeah. So that's where I would wrap it if around that. This one here is getting the markup directly from the field. So I don't need it if around it because it'll just return empty yeah. if nothing's in it, it won't return any markup. But these two here would be a good example of when I would wrap that in like a, an if to make sure that it's rendering correctly when nothing's there. Cool, looks like I'm out of time. <laughs>